On Point with Craig's Investment Partners. The information provided here is general in nature. It's not financial advice. It doesn't take into account your financial situation, objectives, goals or risk tolerance. All investments are subject to risks and none are guaranteed. So before you make any investment decisions, we recommend you contact an investment advisor. For more information about our services in that regard, you can go to our website, which is craigsip.com. Welcome to On Point. I'm Mark Lister, Investment Director at Craig's Investment Partners, and I'll be talking about a range of topics, including economics, portfolio strategy, investor education, and anything else that's happening out there in financial markets. Hi team, hope you're all well. Just wanted to jump on here and talk a little bit about the rebound we saw last week. I've had a lot of questions about why that happened and whether we should expect that strength to continue from here. I think always a difficult question, but there is a strong case for the end of this year being a little bit better than what we've experienced in recent months. So I wanted to run through a few of the reasons why I believe that to be the case. I did touch on this in uh, another episode last week briefly, but I've had a few people suggest that we could talk a little bit more about that. So apologies if we're going over material that you have heard before. Uh, The second thing that I would stress is that always important to make the distinction between the short-term views that we sometimes talk about uh, and, and let's call that you know what we think markets might do over the next one, two, three months, and some of those issues that are bubbling away under the surface that might have a bearing on how financial markets perform looking out 12 months or so. And this is very much uh, something I'm thinking about in the context of the next couple of months. So there are still some things we need to uh, ponder when we consider where markets might go looking ahead into 2024. But let, let's talk about the short term. Look, global markets have had a pretty difficult period since the end of July. Uh, from late July through to the end of October, so those three months, August, September, October, the S&P 500 in the US and the NZX50 index here in New Zealand both fell more than 10%. So they both suffered a correction. So it was a pretty sharp falls in a short space of time. Bonds as well, uh, fixed income, corporate bonds, government bonds, they've also struggled. So it hasn't been just shares that have been falling. It has been bonds that have also been falling. And that's been the case because interest rates have been rising quite strongly. So last month, we saw the yield on a 10-year US Treasury bond hit 5%. And that's the first time we've seen that uh, since 2007. So Treasury bonds hitting a 16-year high that wasn't friendly for the share market. And it obviously saw bond prices decline as well. So you've seen a sell-off everywhere. Here in New Zealand, Uh, We saw the five-year swap rate, which is a wholesale interest rate, and it uh, is sort of one of the building blocks of not only fixed income yields, but also mortgage rates. Uh, That rose to a 13-year high, highest since 2010. So those things are are great for new investors looking to put money to work in income assets and fixed income. Uh, It's a great backdrop. But for people that have existing investments in either bonds or shares, Uh, Not fantastic, because it does put downward pressure on the valuations of those assets. So, been a pretty unsettling time for investors and plenty of uncertainties ahead of us. However, this month, November, has started very well for bonds and shares alike. So, just, just a good time to ponder whether we might see that strength continue and whether 2023 will finish more strongly than what we've seen through this middle part of the year. And I do think there is a good chance that that will be the case. First reason, uh, I'll give you five. Number one is that earnings have been pretty solid. The international reporting season starting to wrap up now. We've seen more than 80% of S&P 500 companies having already reported their results for the September 2023 quarter. But so far, it's been pretty solid. You know, of those that have reported, Four out of five companies have beaten earnings forecasts. So the actual earnings have come in ahead 
of what uh, analysts and investors were expecting. So that's that's good news. Uh, the index overall, if you take all of those S&P 500 companies as a group and sort of aggregate all of the, the earnings re results, uh, in aggregate, the index is on track for earnings to increase 2 or 3% compared to the same quarter a year ago. So it doesn't sound like much, 2 or 3%. It isn't much, but uh, that will be the first increase in a year. And that would be better than people were expecting at the start of the reporting season. So in early October, before any companies started announcing results, people were expecting a small decline. So earnings to be slightly negative and slightly positive is better than slightly negative. So earnings have been solid. Um, outlook statements a little on the soft side, but the actual numbers we've seen have been good. Second reason, and this is probably the biggest one of all, we've seen more evidence lately that inflation is slowing and labour markets are easing. So in New Zealand, uh, we saw the annual inflation rate fall to 5.6%, still far too high. The Reserve Bank's aiming for somewhere between 1 and 3, so 5.6, well above that top end of their target range of 3. But still, it's the lowest in two years, um, and it's well below the peak that we saw uh, from a, a year or so ago of 7.3%. So absolutely coming down and coming down more quickly than the Reserve Bank or financial markets expected. So that's good news. Elsewhere, it's been a similar story. We've got US inflation running at 3.7%. Some new figures are out next week. So we'll uh, get a chance to see if that is, is continued to decline. 3.7% like New Zealand, uh, that's above where the central bank wants it to be. They're aiming for two-ish. But 3.7, still the lowest we've seen in about two and a half years. It was May 2021 when it was last that low. So that's good news. And in Europe, a similar story there as well. Inflation in Europe peaked at more than 10% per annum last year. Today, it's more than halved to uh, about 4 4.5%. So across the board, we've seen inflation come down. We've also seen a bit of easing in the labour market. Uh, partly in New Zealand, that's due to stronger migration. We've got more people. Uh, so our unemployment rate has pushed a little bit higher to 3.9%. That's the highest in more than two years. In the US, unemployment has also been tracking higher. Uh, they're also at 3.9%, which is the highest that we've seen in a little while. And that has just taken the edge off wage pressures. And that's important because uh, it means that we're unlikely to see uh, wages keep rising at the same pace, which means that you won't see those broader price increases come through as well. So that's that's all necessary for inflation to be brought under control. So that is moving in the right direction. And that hopefully, hopefully means that most central banks, or at least many central banks, might be done raising interest rates. So we've seen interest rates across the board, whether it's the New Zealand OCR, whether it's the Fed funds rate in the United States, uh, in Europe, in the UK, everywhere, we've seen interest rates rise significantly over the past two years. But I think we're at the point where many of these central banks are at the top of the hill and the, the last interest rate hike is behind us. In New Zealand, the official cash rate, the OCR, is at 5.5%. That's the highest since 2008. In the US, the Federal Reserve uh, is also at 5.5%, and that's the highest they've had since 2001. Now, both of these central banks uh, the in the US and in New Zealand have left interest rates on hold at their most recent meetings. Uh, the, the RBNZ here in New Zealand last moved in May. Since then, they've been on hold. And in the US, I think it was June when the, the Federal Reserve last hiked rates. And since then, they've also been on hold. So there's an increasing chance that they're done, that the, the last increase is behind us. And now they will just hold the line and at some point reduce interest rates. And you could say the same for others, such as the Bank of England, the European Central Bank, you know, maybe not so much, well, certainly not for the Bank of Japan, maybe not for the Reserve Bank of Australia, but for the most part, central banks have finished raising rates and that's good uh, for investment markets because it means we know how long the piece of string is. Uh, typically, when central banks stop raising rates, that comes at around the same time as the peak in bond yields. Uh, and that's obviously a positive development for the pr uh, the prospective returns from fixed income as well as share markets. So I think that is a really important point too, because you've seen that easing in inflation, you've seen labour markets start to open up a little bit. Hopefully central banks are done. 
Point number four, investor sentiment has fallen in recent months. The American Association of Individual Investors, uh, AAII for short, has been doing a sentiment survey for where the market is headed in the next six months on a weekly basis since 1987. So since the 1980s, every week they've gone out and asked investors, where do you think the market's going over these next six months? And over the years, this has proved to be not a perfect predictor, there's no perfect predictors of financial markets out there, but it has been a useful indicator for identifying turning points, even if it's only on a short term basis. And over the last few weeks, we've seen this uh, sentiment measure fall to the lowest levels in about five months. So investors have become much less optimistic about the outlook, much more cautious. And ironically, uh, historically, it's proved to be a much better time to invest when people are pessimistic. You know, you want to you want you want to do your investing when everyone's nervous, everyone's worried, everything everyone thinks there's trouble ahead. Not when everyone's excited and optimistic and thinks everything's fantastic. So uh, that has proved to be quite a good indicator in the past, and I find it comforting that there's a bit more caution out there. Last one, seasonality is on our side. In contrast to the last three months, and we're talking about August, September, October, which tend to be a really challenging time of year for global share markets, we're now entering a period that is typically more lucrative. So if you look back to World War II, uh, the mid 1940s, uh, since then, and if you look at historic returns for the US share market, the best two months of the year have been November, and December. November number one, December number two. Those two months have the highest average returns of all months. Uh, November 1.7% uh, on average, uh, the market up 1.7%, and December the market typically up uh, or on average up 1.5%. Now the overall monthly average gain uh, is 0.7%. So 1.7, 1.5, which is a lot, that's a big gain in just one month. Uh, but more importantly, well above the average gain of 0.7. And those two months also have the best hit rate in terms of being up rather than down. So November is up 68% of the time, December up 75% of the time. And that compares with the average of all of the 12 months of the year, uh, which is only 62%. So um, seasonality, look, it's it's never going to, it's never something you'd hang your hat on, but uh, it is it is something that um, is just a useful gauge of how sentiment can change throughout the year and what times of the year tend to be uh, better performing periods for investors. So I think you put all that together and we've still got plenty of challenges looking ahead to 2024. And I will talk about some of those later in the week. I've got another another episode lined up to talk about some of the things I'm thinking about heading into next year that relate to some of these issues that, that I've just mentioned. But on a short term basis, you know, talking about the next one, two, three months, uh, and in particularly given the rough patch that markets have experienced since the end of July, I think there is is definitely a chance we might see a more prosperous end to the year. So hopefully that's um, a bit of optimism uh, that we can latch onto. You know, it has been a difficult and a very up and down year. A uh, good first half of the year, then a rough patch through those um, middle to latter months. But some of the signs do point to a, a more prosperous a uh, couple of months to wrap up the year. So let's let's hope that last week's optimism and some of these signposts that we're observing out there in the market do lead to a um, a stronger finish. All right, thanks team. We'll talk again soon.